Lesson 15 on the Holy Fast. In the law, God ordered the sons of Israel to take a tithe every year from all they obtained and to offer it to God. By doing this, they were blessed in all their works. Knowing this, the holy apostles thought about it and decided on something greater and higher to help and benefit our souls, that is to say, to dedicate one-tenth of the days of our life to God, so that we shall be blessed in all our acts and propitiated each year from our sins of a whole year. Therefore they counted and considered as holy from the 365 days of the year, the seven weeks of a fast. Thus they separated seven weeks, but the fathers in their time agreed to add one week more to those weeks. This happened as a warm-up and advanced preparation for those who enter the labor of fasting, and also to honor the holy forty days that our Lord fasted. When we remove the Saturdays and Sundays from eight weeks, we have forty days, honoring Holy Saturday separately because it is most holy and the only Saturday on which we fast throughout the whole year. These seven weeks, without Saturdays and Sundays, become thirty-five days. If we then add the fasting days of Holy Saturday and half of the night of the bright and illustrious day, it becomes thirty-six and a half days, which is exactly one-tenth of the three hundred and sixty-five days of the year, since one-tenth of three hundred is thirty, one-tenth of sixty is six, and one-tenth of five is a half. Thus we have thirty-six and a half days, as we said. This is, so to speak, the annual tithe thing that the holy apostles have sanctified for our repentance, purifying us of our sins, as I said, throughout the whole year. Therefore, brethren, the person who keeps himself well and properly in these holy days is blessed. Even if, as a man, he sins through negligence, Yet God gave him this holy day so that if he tries with vigilance and humility to take care of himself and repent during these days, he purifies himself of a whole year's sins. His soul is relieved of its burden and he approaches the holy day of resurrection purified and partakes of the holy mysteries without condemnation, becoming a new man through repentance in the holy fast. He has joy and gladness celebrating the whole of Holy Pentecost with God. Pentecost is a resurrection of the soul, as they say. This is why we have a symbolic custom of not kneeling in church right through till Holy Pentecost. Therefore, all those who want to purify themselves from the whole year's sins by fasting during these days must first pay attention to what they eat, since not all foods are the same. This is because, as the fathers say, indiscriminate eating causes all evil. In the same way, he must be careful not to break the fast without great need, not to seek the tasteful means, and not to burden himself with much food and drink. There are two forms of gluttony. The first is when a person seeks the taste. He does not want much food, but he wants it to be appetizing. When this person eats the food that he likes, he is so defeated by the pleasure of its taste that he keeps this food in his mouth for a long time, chewing it, and he does not have the heart to swallow it because of a pleasure. This is called lemargia or fastidious gluttony. Another case is when somebody does not desire a tasteful food, but he wants to satisfy himself. He does not like the nice food, but whether the food is good or bad, he merely wants to eat. If there is everything, the only thing he cares about is filling his stomach. This is called gastrimargia, or pure gluttony from greed. I shall tell you the reason for these names. To the ancient Greeks, margia meant mania, and margos, somebody who is mad. Therefore, when this sickness, that is to say, the mad desire to fill the stomach, comes upon a person, it is called gastrimargia, gluttony, 
that is to say, the mania to fill the stomach. However, the sickness of the pleasure of a palate is called lemargia, fastidious gluttony, fastidiousness, that is, the madness of a pleasure of a palate. The person who, with vigilance, wants to purify himself from his sins, must guard against all this, since all these things are not needs of the body, but are the results of a passion, and if one tolerates them, they become sins. It is like the case of lawful marriage and fornication. The act is the same, but the difference lies in the aim. In the one case, the union is through a desire for children, in the other through a desire for pleasure. So it is also with food. We do the same when we eat through need and when we eat for pleasure. What constitutes the sin is the intention. To eat according to need is when one limits what he waits for himself each day and he sees whether that measure was a burden and so he must lessen it and he does so or if it was not sufficient and he was exhausted so he needs to add a little. He adds some and thus rightly searches out his need and receives exactly what is necessary not for pleasure but for the strengthening of his body. A person must receive what he receives with prayer, blaming himself, with the thought that he is unworthy of every consolation. He must pay no attention when another person eats something special, because, of course, there was a need or necessity for that, lest he should seek consolation or think that if he asks for more it will not harm him. Once, when I was in the monastery, I visited a certain elder, there were many great elders, and I found the brother who served him eating with him. I said to this brother privately, Do you know, my brother, these elders who you know, see eating and with some better service, are like those men who, whilst they have gained a purse of money, remain working and adding to it until it is full. Despite the fact that they have sought it, they still work and collect another thousand pieces of money for themselves to be able to rediscover and use it in a time of need. Thus, they keep what was in the purse. In the same way, these elders keep working and collecting treasures for themselves even after they have sealed up their treasures. They work and collect a few more so that they have them now in the time of sickness and senility. They take from them and keep the rest stored up, but as for us, we have not even obtained the purse yet, so what do we take from? That is why, even when we take for our needs, we must, as I have said, blame ourselves as unworthy of every service and even of a monastic life. We must not take what is for our needs without fear. Only in that way will it not be for our judgment. Enough about temperance of a stomach. We need not only to be careful about our food, but also to escape from every sin. Thus, as we fast with our stomach, we must fast with our tongue, abandoning slander, lies, ill chatter, reproach, anger, and basically any sin that is committed by the tongue. Likewise, we must fast with our eyes, so that we do not see idly, nor do we act boldly with the eyes looking impudently. Also, we must prevent our hands and feet from performing any evil. This fasting, as St. Basil says, is an acceptable fast, as we abstain from every evil manifested through all the senses. We proceed to the holy day of resurrection, as we have already said, renewed, cleaned, and worthy of a communion of the holy mysteries. First, we go out to meet our Lord and welcome Him with palms and olive branches, sitting on a donkey and entering the holy city. What is the significance of sitting on a donkey? He sat on a donkey so that the word of God should bring back the irrational soul, which is like the senseless beasts, and submit it to His deity. What is the significance of going to meet Him with palms and olive branches? When a person goes to war against his enemy and comes back as a victor, all his own people meet him with palms. The palm is the symbol of victory. Also, if somebody has been unjustly treated 
and he wants to present himself to the judge to give him justice, he seeks olive branches and shouts for mercy and help. The olive branches are the symbol of mercy. Thus, we welcome Christ our Lord with palms as the victor. He has defeated the enemy for us. We also seek mercy from him with olive branches. As he has been victorious for us, so we also seek to win and to keep the symbols of the victory. Those symbols represent not only his victory that he achieved for us, but also the success we have attained through his help and through the prayers of all the saints. Amen.